move on to mini story number three with our wonderful uh, Susan Douglas, uh, a, a very wonderful collaborator in this workshop. And for those of you who missed uh, the beginning, uh, we I introduced Susan Douglas uh, from Georgetown University earlier. Um, we are collaborating on this workshop um, as part of a um, Title VI um, uh, effort at bringing African studies in the classroom. So take it away, Susan. Thank you very much. I'm going to go right ahead to share my screen, which I hope you can confirm I am sharing. Yes. Okay, great. So I teach um, a big history course called um, World History STEAM Plus, the plus being for STEAM plus humanities. And I actually begin this course like big history does with the Big Bang and going through the geological and biological history of the world. Um, it doesn't take as long as you might think. I have a PowerPoint that talks about teaching prehistory um, that is also in the folder. But this particular story is um, the journey of mankind. That is about the DNA information um, that we have now, the various types of proof and what it's corroborated with um, of how human beings managed to populate the earth. And you will see this is based on a... Um, a resource that was first put together as an interactive map by the Bradshaw Foundation, which is a magnificent repository of cave art, which is where my background came from, rock art and cave art. So as I go through this, I want to, um, I want to show in, in let you know that I'm actually using instructions, uh, giving you instructions for doing this, which are replicated in the PowerPoint that's available in the resource guide. So it has to start with an introduction to human DNA. Um, particularly, I uh, want to note that this is information is not being given to the students for mastery or they're going to be terrified. It's being given to them out of interest. Um, I tell them to relax and just take it in and try to introduce it, you know, gradually. And I'm telling them you're not going to be tested on mastery of this. If you're partnering with a science teacher, then it is possible that you can achieve a little bit higher degree and they will handle the assessment in terms of mastery. The best introduction I found is here. It's a TED talk. Uh, just about three or four minutes um, called The Book of You, which has some great wow factors in it. And it also has a little quiz, which I let them take, but I don't grade it for how, how um, effectively they have actually um, mastered it. So then I have a kind of fun activity that is the next set of readings, which starts with uh, me walking in class when we used to have actual classes, not virtual, wearing a button which says over 25% of human genes are the same as those of a banana. Get over yourself. And then there's one that comes from an exhibit from the Minnesota Museum of Science, which is called um, A Walk Through Time from Stardust to Us, which is we are all but stardust. And so we are stardust and bananas. So we can wear both those stickers. They can be printed out. They're also in the folder. So these two readings, I won't open them up because we don't have time in this story, but they're there. One of them is an overview from the original uh, genographic project of the National Geographic Society. Um, and then the second one is Exploring Your DNA Journey, which was about at the introduction to the um, to when people first started doing these kits long before, you know, uh, 23 and me. Um, so this was the science behind it. It's quite light. It's nicely illustrated and so on. So then the next one, this is the this is the real piece. We've prepared them now. I've had them do some small reflective readings um, and the quiz. So I know that they're tuned into what this is. So this website is um, is unfortunately been made extinct in one sense by the um, extinction of Adobe Flash, which is how it was programmed like many other things. But there is a way to view it and I've given you full instructions here and actually managed somehow to search out the actual SWF file, which uh, can, can be played in a Flash emulator. So that's just to let you know, it's a little bit technical, but not very, and it's really worth the trip. So what this website is, is um, based on the fact that the Bradshaw Foundation did all kinds of research into, um, into rock art all over the world, not just the Lascaux Cave and Chauvet and things like that, but all over the world. Um, so this map contains um, three different kinds of evidence. And this is important to let our students know how we know what we know or what we think we know now, because we don't know how this may change in the future. But those three things are um, evidence from archeology, span 
or paleontology, meaning um, rock art finds and other artifact finds like the Bombos Cave and, and various other things, the middens that were found around the Indian Ocean, um, the DNA information that comes from these studies of, I think now it's more than a million people who have been uh, DNA tested around the world. And then finally from uh, information on climate change, which comes from ice cores and other types of evidence. And incidentally, also some on volcanic activity. So you will see that this website allows you to navigate forward. I do have to warn you that because of the flash issue, and by the way, the Bradshaw Foundation says they're revamping, reprogramming this site, this resource, but it's been a couple of years and they have not yet done so. So for that reason, a couple of the features don't work, but you can advance it and tell the story. And the reason I'm recommending this resource is because it's something you can do in your classroom in one session. 45 minutes, 55 minutes, and that, of course, for us is gold as teachers, but it still has that impact because you can go back and forth between, oh, this is what the climate was like while this phase was happening. And of course, to begin with telling the story, you need to let people know what is the scale of time. And so you have down here this timeline that starts out with 150,000 years ago and takes you as you move through the interactive map all the way to 10,000, which as we know is the beginning of farming, which is what this map ends with. Okay, so um, so the, 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 the next phase of what we do is to be able to, after they've absorbed it, and um, I actually have them do something which I'll show you in the assessment, um, but you can go back and review the content. There's a, a more up-to-date version of this, um, but it's just not as, as, as dramatic somehow as that one that I'm showing you where I found the film. But this is, it, is here, it is on the uh, Ca California Academy, and it is, um, it is also a timeline-based map. And again, if you wanted to, uh, to, to not use the journey of mankind, you could also use this one. And you see the three pieces of evidence that go together, archaeological sites, climate conditions, and human encounters. And then here you have an interactive, this one's not hot link, but it is here uh, hyperlinked in the, in the slide. So you have full instructions for doing this. And it can be done in about three class periods, two if you absolutely had to. And that includes an, uh, a homework assignment. The assessment ideas. Um, again, in a history class, you're teaching the DNA information for exposure, not mastery. Um, if you're collaborating with science, that's a different matter that they can do the heavy lifting on that. What I had them do for an initial assessment, again, was to write little reflections as they read and to do some little feedback exercises, like a little quiz to see what they absorb, but not to grade it. Okay. Then I had them at the end um, use Flipgrid to produce a two minute video on their reflections on what they have learned and how it changed their views on human migration and of the connectedness of humanity. And in particular about the issue of, um, of, of informing the discussion of race and the construction of race. This absolutely changed the discussion about race for the entire two year world history course, because we could then see how this idea was constructed and how we are now able to deconstruct ideas of race through this DNA information. So that's what I have for you. That's my first story of three. And I thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, this is always fascinating and uh, particularly given the highly divisive uh, times of struggle around equity and uh, understandings of difference, uh, cultural difference, racial difference. Um, this, this kind of lesson has a particular uh, importance in our classroom. So uh, we have the opportunity to hear why this is important, why this is important to bring uh, content that contextualizes science, that brings in the content that centers and celebrates Africa uh, from the experience of two students who were in the United States and now are in Kenya. Um, Hi, my name is Sierra Pruitt, and this is my younger brother. Seth Pruitt. And, um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, can we restart? Hi, my name is Sierra Pruitt, and this is my younger brother. Seth Pruitt. And we live in Nairobi, Kenya. So um, today we're just going to be talking about uh, experience in the US and also here, and education and that kind of thing. So Seth. Uh, you didn't really get to school that much in the U.S., so I think I'll just tell you about my experience there. 
Uh, we didn't learn anything about Africa, really. Uh, we played African drums, but they were just regular drums with tribal prints at the side. So when it came to anything to do with Africa, I was pretty much getting all my information from mom and anything about African-American culture was from dad. So I just really didn't know what to expect, especially when we were moving here. I was literally petrified. Like I was scared out of my mind thinking we were going to be living in poverty because that's all you see on TV is kids starving, send them a dollar, I don't know. So um, yeah, in school, like we didn't really get to learn about this uh, continent, let alone countries individually. Mm. One thing I can remember is when I was moving here, uh, people like myself, obviously, because we all didn't learn about Africa or Kenya, they thought I was, again, moving to the jungle. They were asking me if we we're gonna ride giraffes, if we were going to have to learn African, which as if it's a language all on its own. Um, so yeah, people didn't know what to expect either because again, we didn't learn about it. So it's not surprising when people assume that Africa or even just speak about Africa as if it's a country, you know, because you don't even learn anything about it, let alone, you know, that there are different countries and each country has its own culture, its own languages and things like that. It, there's really nothing you're you're going based off what you see on tv or what you see on the internet so i think we're a bit lucky that we know that we are kenyan yeah. you know so we got that culture from mom's side and we're able to live here and experience that for ourselves it opened my eyes personally to all africa like really has to offer like how many different cultures and different aspects that you can um, learn about so that was really great for me, um, especially in my last few years before I finished uh, high school. If I had to change anything, I would incorporate more um, culture into the curriculum. And I'm saying this from an African standpoint, but I would incorporate every other you know, region of the world as well, because I feel like with American curriculum, it's so Western centered like everything is from a western perspective so that is what i would love to see in um, the curriculum especially for the new or your you know generation still in school so yeah thank you so much um to seth and sierra pruitt uh who are um uh, who came to us via also our next speaker's uh, 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 contacts in Kenya uh, for centering why this is important uh, because there's such absence or distortion of this knowledge. Uh, and you will, uh, just as a little preview, you will see uh, Seth later on uh, as Seth the scientist uh, in, a, in a short video. So our next speaker is Dr. Joy Kiano, uh, who is a science education specialist um, She's an educator, school leader, a teacher of science who's deeply passionate about the education and welfare of young people. She founded and led the Nova Pioneers Girls School in Tattoo City and Learning Initiatives Manager Nova Pioneer School. As an established scientist, um, she twice appointed to serve the government of Kenya as technical advisor and appointed chair of technical committee and members of the board of directors of the National Biosafety Authority in Kenya. She's taught as head of science at Hillcrest International School. Uh, she's a, a, an extremely experienced teacher as teacher of science in Oxfordshire and uh, also at the master's level um, at the University of Oxford. She has a doctorate in biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of London and uh, another diploma from biotechnology from the University of Helsinki. Um, she is the global ambassador for Engine TV Africa, which is the resource that will be centered here uh, in her next presentation to ensure that this work is seen in her because it's so incredibly important. I'm just so honored to be able to work with Joy, uh, who wears her name perfectly, by the way. Um, since we have begun collaborating, it's, she has truly been a joy to work with. So welcome, Dr. Joy. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here.
Okay. Thank you so much, Elsa. Hi, everybody. My name is Joy. Um, I'm coming in from Nairobi in Kenya. And as Elsa said, I am the global ambassador for, for Engine TV um, Africa, which is a Pan African science show that is geared towards our African children. However, what I wanted to do today is kind of make this a little bit like a lesson plan uh, in which I would incorporate um, some learning ideas. And then it's, I really would love this to have a lot of uh, feedback um, from the teachers and a lot of engagement throughout. Every once in a while, I will share the PowerPoint um, with my images on. I've got a full PDF document available. I've given it to Elsa that covers everything that I'm speaking about today. And this PowerPoint will also be available. So in my day, um, which was so long ago, I don't want to talk about it. When we did um, lesson plans, um, they were almost like a menu. So you had your starter, you had your mains, and then you had, it wasn't dessert, so it was the end. So I thought I would start um, a little bit like that. Because um, one of the best ways of doing stuff with young people is engaging them. And so I am going to assume that you can see my presentation. And I can, and it's I think loading. everybody can too. Yes. Yay! Super. So this is what I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, but as with any kind of presentation that you're doing for young people, you've got to try and break them in. You know, um, you've got to say, right, hi, this is a science lesson. How am I going to keep your attention going for the next 45 minutes? So, teachers, these are African Nobel Prizes. I've given you the answer already. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> the question was going to be, what do these people have in common? But because teachers sometimes don't look at what they're doing, they also present the answers. So anyway, here we've got four African Nobel Prizes, uh, uh, prize laureates. Um, and one of the things that you could do, since you can't actually do what Joyce just said, which was, um, who are these people and what do they have in common, is ask a simple question. Um, do you know where they're from? Um, do you know anything about them? These are all Nobel laureates. So if we started um, with these guys, the hint was going to be, who's this, who's this fellow over here, Desmond Tutu? Um, but yeah, teachers, you know, this, yeah, my bad. You're not supposed to put the answer on the first slide. So <laughs> moving on, we have got uh, four people here plus Desmond Tutu, it's a hint. And then another hint was going to be our beautiful, the late Wangari Mathai. So here we've got four um, famous um, African Nobel laureates. These are actually six of 11 Nobel Peace Prize laureates from the continent. Um, and here's a couple of interesting facts. So for instance, this um, smart young man here is Anwar Sadat. He was the president of Egypt. Um, and he was awarded the um, Nobel Prize. I've actually got his date here. Let me look at my cheat sheet. He also awarded the Nobel Prize in 1978 together with, of all people, uh, Menachem Begin, who was the prime minister of the state of Israel. Um, and Sadat was a president of the Arab Republic of Egypt, Northeast Africa from 1970 to 19. 81. Both of these two leaders got a, a Nobel Prize in science, uh, in peace for trying to bring peace to the Middle East. Here we've got a famous man called Kofi Annan. He got his um, Nobel Prize in 2001. At the time, he was the seventh Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, and he is a national of the Republic of Ghana in West Africa. Um, the next person we have on this list is F.W. de Klerk from South Africa. An interesting fact about F.W. de Klerk 
was he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize together with Nelson Mandela. Um, Nelson Mandela was, as we all know, the first black president of the Republic of South Africa. Um, and these two gentlemen um, were recognized for their achievements in ending apartheid um, in South Africa. You know, sometimes your children will know certain people, but they'll be really, really surprised when somebody else, uh, you know, when they see this person. What's this white man doing getting a Nobel Prize um, for peace in South Africa? What the hell's going on here? Uh, he got it from Nelson Mandela. I didn't know that. And then here we go. This beautiful lady, uh, she's called Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She was the president of the Republic of Liberia in West Africa between 2006 and 2018. She was actually the first woman head of state um, in an African country the first woman head of state. Um, and what's really interesting about um, Dr. Sirleaf is she was awarded a um, Nobel Prize with this lady. Um, I actually didn't know anything about this lady until I was reading up about um, Dr. Sirleaf's um, award. And I put a hyperlink to her, her story here, she is an amazing lady. She was only born in 1972. Um, she, together with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, created a women's rights movement in Liberia. Um, you need to read her story. She is the a victim of domestic abuse. She ran away, she was taken away from home and forced into marriage, I think, at the age of 14. There's so much um, about this amazing lady. So now, what's this got to do with the engine? What's this got to do with, you know, getting Africa into a context um, of learning? There's something that we can do here, and I'll spiral back to these uh, people in a little while. But when you're talking to the children, you're, um, to your students, and you've got an audience, because now they're like, wow, so what are we going to learn? This is, I didn't know these people existed. Um, this is all really fascinating. Um, you ask them to identify where these people came from on the continent. Um, but yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. So, Let's go a little bit more about me. Um, and I'm gonna pause my share right there for now and tell you a little bit more about Engine. And if you hear people rustling, that, that's nothing you should worry about really. <laughs> Just gonna make sure I got all my notes together. So um, Engine, e, uh, N apostrophe G-E-N is pronounced Engine. It is one of the first it's the very first science TV show um, hosted by African teachers and scientists for an African audience. Engine was born um, through lockdown, but has just exploded into, um, into the um, ether. People are very, very excited to learn about um, young children learning about science, um, and these are little black children learning about science from black Africans, preferably women and men, but actually what's going on in their backyard. Why was this important? Um, across the world and more so in Africa, science is thought of as a really, really difficult subject. It's like the clever person's um, subject um, and across uh, around the world, I know a lot of times science is um, presented as abstract theory, lots of calculation, lots of memorization, lots of things that you have to do. Um, and it actually can make, um, it can really put people off. So, um, Engine actually takes it from a different point of view. It immerses the young person in an experience that's going on outside in their communities. And I'll show you exactly what I mean in the next slide. Um, we use African experts and wherever possible, we make sure that we've got African women um, and, Africa, and African women scientists and researchers, and they will engage with young people who reflect our target audience. 
um, we try to get the young people during the show to our audience to um, keep um, entertained by a variety of different activities. So they'll watch a small learning bite and it will be interspersed with a fun activity, a song, a dance, a did you know, a brain teaser, um, exercising with our very, very enthusiastic um, Tahiti. Um, and there's also a moment uh, for mindfulness, appreciating that in 45 minutes, a young person can require a break. Um, our education material um, engages lots of young people in many ways. Um, I have shared a lot of resources for you to have a look at the different ways in which uh, you can do it, but it's really, really important to move on. It's All right, go up to um, the page before with the shoe bill. So yes, there we go. The idea here is an old information is that my cheat sheet. So what are the kind of things you can tell young people about um, when they're looking at this to engage them? Um, there's interesting facts, um, fun facts like, did you know the, in order for the shoe bill to, to keep cool, they have to pull on their legs. Um, their most recent um, relative is um, the dinosaur. Um, their food, their specialist food, like the lungfish, actually existed before the dinosaurs did, um, which are the kind of wonderful, fun things that uh, young kids would really, really um, like to learn. And then also, if you look at the red marked area on the map of Africa, that is the area in which, within the continent, that you find um, the shoe bills. And there's a couple of dots there. Um, and the question is, yeah, thanks, move the cursor there. Um, do you know what the names of those countries are? Um, just as an activity for the children. So these are the kind of different things that you can tell um, your children about this activity before you've even begun on watching the episode. Um, can children identify three things that can confirm that the shoe bill is a bird? Uh, and teachers, uh, I'd be really happy if you could throw a couple of ideas in there um, so that we could see that while you're paying attention. Um, what three things would help you confirm that this is actually a bird? What are the three specific things that happen here? Yes, feathers is a good one. Um, what else? It has a beak, yes. Uh, so does a duckbill platypus. Lays eggs, so do frogs. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing for you. There is our scientist on a trip to the Museum of Kenya, and there are the skeletal remains of um, a boy called the Turkana boy. His remains are really, really important um, because they were the first nearly complete um, skeletal remains of um, ancient man. To a kind of boy was estimated to be about 15 years of age. Um, he was found in northern, his remains were found in northern Kenya. Um, this story is incorporated into our learning activity about the human skeleton, um, in which on the P PDF that Elsa will share with you, I've shown a couple of learning activities that you can do with um, just this episode. One of the things that we discovered was that um, many teachers were complaining that teaching about bones is really, really difficult. So um, having an activity like this where, in fact, um, Irene, our, our teacher from um, Kampala, said they made an activity where the children and their families had to create a life-size skeleton of one of, the one of the members of the family, cut it out and put it together and try and connect all the different parts. Furthermore, um, uh, my favorite part of this episode is the sing song that comes along where our teacher sings bones and the kids have to sing it and the repetition and the action helps the young children um, identify what is, um, you, you know, where all the different bones are. Um, there's lots of stories um, available on the bones episode, including an amazing one that comes in our Africa teacher challenge that talks about um, an, an amazing discovery in South Africa. 
And again, this comes back to, do you know where South Africa is? Um, so if you click on the two slides up, that's got the map of the continent. Can you see it? Yes, that one. Everything comes back to this activity for young children um, as an idea of how you could work through our, our episodes. The children can take a, a, a map like this. In fact, the one before is interactive, but let's not use it in case anything goes wrong. It, when, you, when you get this um, 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 PDF, you can look at it and you can actually slide over each of the countries and it gives you its name. Now, what are we looking at here? We're looking at the continent of Africa. Did you know that young children within the continent automatically know that they live within a continent? You don't find our kids here saying, oh, um, Africa's a big country. And it could have something to do with the language. So in Kiswahili, which is spoken across quite a few of the Eastern and Central African countries, to say, Africa, if you were referring to Africa um, in conversation, you wouldn't just say Africa, you'd say bara la Africa, bara la Africa. That means the continent of Africa. It's always identified um, as a continent. It's like it needs that prefix where, so you say, um, this is Mrs. Africa. So you say bara la Africa. And if you're talking about different countries within, you say nchi, nchi la Kenya. Chila, Uganda. So every single time, yes, or even Mother Africa, yes. Um, but because of these interactions, um, we find that our children here begin to, even though, even though we don't get as much African learning within our curricula, they still have a natural understanding for their continent because I guess it's part of our language. It is part of how um, we speak and refer to, to, um, to ourselves. So one of the activities you could do here with the children is draw a map across a map of the continent, put a grid, a four, four grid. So you've got your um, north, south, east, west arrows, and then you ask them to identify specific countries and specific places. So as the worksheet or the handout I've given you has got Wangari Mathai comes from Kenya. It, actual, the official name is the Republic of Kenya, comma, East Africa. If we looked for where um, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson comes from, um, it's right on the um, if you look at the continent of Africa and you look at the West, yes, right there, right there, 10 points, that's Liberia. And that is, um, well, I'm not gonna pretend to, I don't wanna get it wrong. Um, that is the Republic of Liberia, West Africa. Um, of course, everybody knows where South Africa is, um, its identity is in its name, um, but Egypt, where is Egypt on this map? Some people don't even realize that Egypt is part of Africa. Um, the full and accurate name for Egypt is the Arab Republic of Egypt, and it's in Northeast Africa. It's the top right-hand corner country on the continent. Um, these are the kind of things that will get young people going. And you could even begin to talk about what do you know about these places across the continent? There's two very big um, rivers that are found on the continent. There's the Nile that starts that starts in Central East Africa um, and Lake Victoria, which um, covers Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania and flows all the way north. Um, and is deposited into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, on the western side of Africa is the, is the Niger River. And that one is also a very long river that cuts across about three or four different countries on the western side. There's so many different things that you can do to engage um, um, and allow for interest of, of young children here, coloring in that is my most favorite activity, just getting them sitting down, coloring in, and then learning something about each of these different countries. When you look at the episodes um, that we have on Engine, you'll notice that they do actually mention the country and then they highlight where it is on the continent. 
Um, and then if they find similarities, like in the wetlands episode, they talk about the papyrus um, grasses that the kids are say um, are rowing through on the swamp. Um, they tell them, do you know what papyrus is for? Um, do you know which other countries have papyrus? And hey, teachers, which other countries have papyrus apart from in the swamp in Entebbe? And any ideas for what papyrus would be used for? Any ideas? I know you know, I'm waiting for something to come in through the chat. Otherwise, I will start to sing. Yay, Maggie, paper. I think making baskets, yes, that's true too. Um, and anybody know where else? Um, it's actually in the Bible as well, the story of papyrus. Somebody was discovered in the River Nile wrapped I've, I've never seen it as a textile yes it comes from Egypt and in actual fact the word paper comes from papyrus but um, papyrus is is found uh, in the wetlands across a major part of the continent of Africa um, our kids um, need to begin to realize that there's so much that they can learn about themselves about where they come from um, and take pride in, in their own continent. So one of the most important things that Engine does is empower young people. First, you get, you get the creativity. Oh gosh, I didn't know that papyrus was found in all these different countries. I didn't know a shoe bill um, evolved from a dinosaur and eats food that's older than dinosaurs. Egypt is a desert. That's all I can think of. Um, Gosh, the longest river in the world, second longest river in the world flows through Egypt. These are things that you're encouraging them to understand. But more than anything through Engine, what we do is we let the kids see themselves um, on the screen. They don't find scientists that look like Albert Einstein. They see a beautiful African woman standing in front of them, talking to them about um, her speciality in science and taking them outside, just outside their doorstep and making them become involved and engaged in, in a new way of learning science. That's my 30 minute um, timer gone. And finally, uh, attached to the PDF will be the listings um, of season two, which is coming out. Um, next month and all the episodes that are available are oh, gorillas that that is just the most it, it amazing um episode there's so much to learn i i engine makes me feel like a little kid i i really enjoy watching the episodes they have got one called as well called the disease detect detectives that goes into the forest, the Zika forest in Uganda. It, it, they go meet scientists that um, work on in the CDC COVID pandemic um, lookout point. Um, there's just so much in there. Um, we hope that Engine will help in, uh, inspire um, young people to look at science differently to imagine that they too can be scientists. Um, and, um, you know, this is, this is us. Um, and I hope that this has been really helpful for you. And please, we've got a Facebook page. If you could go on and give us your feedback, tell us what you think, we'd love, love to hear from you. My name is Joy Keanu. I am the global ambassador for Engine TV Africa. Uh, I really enjoyed presenting this, albeit there were technical hitches. Um, but yes, I would love to hear from you all now. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can put me back on the screen now. <laughs> Hi guys. <laughs> So um, any questions? Yes, Elsa uh, asked me to facilitate the Q&A. So if you would like to um, enter your questions into the chat, or if you would like to um, unmute yourself and ask, 
that will be fine. We have a few minutes and um, this will be followed by our lunch and take care of your family break. So please, any questions? We already say uh, someone who's writing, uh, I am excited to use NGen in my classroom. Thanks so much for introducing this resource. I am too, I had never heard awesome. of it. <laughs> so questions, anybody? So while the questions are coming up, you, I'd like to say that you can find NGen um, in North America on Africa TV. Um, I think it comes on, it, um, it was um, being aired, a, no, I think it's still on. It comes on Saturdays about 4.30, I think it's Eastern Standard Time. Engine is also, was also highlighted um, on Discovery Education over the month of August, um, presenting um, our season one shows for young kids. Uh, there was a teacher from Kansas who tweeted, thanks Engine, um, and showed us a photograph of her kids sat in front of a screen watching a wonderful teacher, Irene, talking about vibration and physics lessons. Um, there's, there's just so much in there that is, is, is really cool um, to learn um, and to engage yourselves with. Um, I didn't yeah. view that one. She was using um, a drum and some particles on a drum to show yeah, the, yeah. the vibration, the patterns that it makes. Absolutely ingenious. Um, she's Absolutely. asking, um, uh, someone here is asking, um, are most videos on the YouTube channel and what age groups videos, are yeah. targeted? Mm. All our videos are on the YouTube um, channel. If you just look up Engine, um, you'll see the entire series is there. In fact, what we have done as well, if you go to the YouTube page, is not only do you get the full episodes, they're also broken down into learning segments and activities for kids. So there's the activities, um, I can, the first one I can think of is how to make a fossil. Um, or they, they're broken down into even the mindfulness moments. And Elsa, just for you, my cat has come to say hello. So, yeah. <laughs> hello. <laughs> We've all gotten to know our various animals during the Zoom time. <laughs> Science lesson can be framed around her. <laughs> Absolutely. Why is she so powerful? But yes, all our episodes are there, available, um, and um, there's loads of wonderful resources. Um, Irene, um, who was actually one of the founding uh, teachers of Engine, has also shared quite a few activities, um, which I think I've put a hyperlink on the document. The document has uh, like three appendices, and one of them has just got places for you to go to directly and click on. Um, I know we're kind of out of time now. So when you when you look for uh, on YouTube, you have to put the uh, asterisk between N and Jen, and then it comes right up. There are multiple playlists there and um, uh, have fun. Perfect. It's 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 this is a really I think gets at the crux of the discussion and the the, the core themes that we wanted to bring today. And this is also again in part of our rationale why we in integrated all these stories in in the event today is because approaching it from a myopic singular uh, lens is just so reductive. And we know that the intersections of history and geography and science and mathematics and place and 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 connection and culture are all intertwined so um so thank you so much um dr joy uh for this wonderful presentation for this amazing resource um uh, that that i just find so incredible um and thank you also for uh for connecting us to sierra and seth and sean pruitt who and you will see seth a little bit later uh on on a next story